We're going to read <clears throat> Romans 13 in a little bit, but before we do, <clears throat> we're going to look at some things on the back of our outline. And again, if you're visiting, they're there, and this will help you because we'll kind of follow through this. We're going to take a bit of a detour as we begin, but just something to kind of picture in terms of the overall kind of view of Scripture. If you've been in class with me before, one of the things that uh, I'm always looking for, and I'm in an Old Testament class and would never have thought of this myself, and our teacher said, as you read through Scripture, always carefully look for and notice the first time God introduces significant themes and ideas that are going to be carried on through the rest of Scripture. And like, for example, this last week as we went to see the ark, you start reading about Noah, and the first time the word righteous is used is used of Noah. He was a righteous man. And then you start and think, okay, this is the first time God introduces us to this, and how significant is holy, godly, and righteous and righteousness through the rest of the scripture, including with Jesus. The first time the terms clean and unclean are used. So many clean, so many unclean animals that go into the ark. And even when you come to the end of the book of Revelation, oh, nothing unclean will enter the holy city. But today we're going to be in Genesis 22 for just a second. You don't have to turn there. We'll just do this verbally. And guys, if, if you were 99 and she was 89 when you conceived a child, I just, I, I can hardly imagine the reality of the term Isaac meaning laughter. Can you imagine the laughter in the tent of a hundred and a ninety year old woman having a baby? And just the, the joy of that. We had some friends who were not able to have a child and they finally adopted. And I asked her once, I said, do you ever, you know, get weary, get tired? She says, oh no. Uh, we waited so many years for him to come. I don't wake him up, but sometimes I just come in the room and listen to him breathe. I'm just so thrilled to have a little one in our house. So just try to imagine being 190 and having he laughs in your tent. And how old is he? Is he mid-teenage or something? We know he's old enough to carry the wood. I wonder if Isaac is 14 or 15, and God says, go sacrifice this son. Can I just kind of do this? I mean, you just imagine how deflating that would be because the promise took 25 years to fulfill, and then here he is, this strong, young, probably teenager, and God says, I want you to go offer this son. And then here it comes. The first time the word love is used in the Bible is take your son that you love and offer him. And let me just shake down the chills for a second. The first time the word worship is used in the Bible and this old man says to the servants, the boy and I are going to go yonder and we are going to worship and we will return. And in his mind, he's thinking, even if I kill him, since this is the child of promise, surely God will raise him from the dead. We also know something of Isaac's age because they're getting everything ready and you can tell they've done this before. And what's the question that Isaac asked Abraham? 
uh, Father, where's the lamb for the sacrifice? And so the first time the word love, the first time the word worship, and the first example of a lamb for a sacrifice are all introduced to us in Genesis 22. How many echoes do we hear about what's going to happen 2,000 years later when the Lamb of God dies for the sins of the world on the cross? I want to extend to the very end, and then we're just going to stop and look at this influence. I don't know how this is going to work out. We'll just have to wait and see when we get there. But at least in imagery, there is a reminder of the cross in the vision of Revelation. I looked at the throne and there was what? The lamb that was slain. I don't know what exactly that means. Here's what is always amazing to me. And I tried to explain this to our kids when they were small. Before Bethlehem, Jesus is God, God, as the Father is. But beginning at Bethlehem, when the Word became flesh, He became God, man, and He never was going to be able to go back to being God, God again. In His nature, He would forever be different. And a part of the significance of that is that even after he is raised from the dead, Scripture describes the risen Lord as a man. Mars Hill, God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world by the man, Jesus Christ. Oh, Timothy, there is one mediator, spokesman, for us between God, and it is the man, Jesus Christ. And it's so hard for us to comprehend that he who was totally holy and totally spirit then assumes our nature, but he will forever be like us. And that's why when the Hebrew writer says, he had to be made like his brethren in every way. And it just stretches the comprehension that someone who is totally spirit, totally God, had never been hungry, never had a cold, never dealt with physical issues, becomes like us. And then as scripture closes, then here's this wonderful description around the throne is the lamb who was slain. I don't know exactly what that's going to mean. I wonder if for eternity we will have a permanent reminder of the depth of the love and the sacrifice of the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. Oftentimes in talking to brand new Christians who've never studied scripture, I said, here's something just to permanently keep with you. None of us will ever walk the streets of gold were it not for the blood of Jesus. Now, as you look at the beginning of the Old Testament, the first five books, and we did this again recently in another context, but we'll do it quickly. <clears throat> the same teacher asked, he said, what's the center of the Torah, the law? What's the center of the teaching of Moses? And again, repeat, as he turns his hand down, <clears throat> he goes and he says, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. And then he says, and what is the center of Leviticus? And then quietly he said, the day of at one month in Leviticus 16 is the center of the center of the law of Moses. The heart of what the whole teaching is about is once a year, the high priest offered a sacrifice first for himself and for his family, and then he comes back and they have the two goats, 
cast lots. One will become the scapegoat, confesses sin on them. The other goat sacrifices, and only once a year he goes in to make atonement for the people. Obviously, we don't have a whiteboard or a chalkboard, but through the years, I've loved just to draw a picture of the Old Testament and say, oh, here's Abraham 2,000 years before. Here's Mount Sinai about 1,500 years. Here's a crown. Here's King David about 1,000. And then you come down, and then here's the cross. And then I like to draw a visual of the cross and just lay it all across the Old Testament. And in type and in shadow, then God is predicting, God is anticipating. And like, for example, I've mentioned this when we came back from Australia, and I'm so proud that they did this. Um, Eastside was the first congregation to start raising money to send Bibles into or New Testaments into Russia after the Iron Curtain fell. And the elders went to a meeting and they said, uh, currently we can send in a New Testament for a dollar each. And we didn't have the money, but the elders went straight to the bank, borrowed $50,000 to buy New Testaments to send into Russia. And so on this wall was a thermometer. And as people gave to repay that loan, and like I said, the, the, the church didn't have the money in hand, but the elders said, this is such an important thing. We're going to put up the building for collateral, and we're going to borrow $50,000 to send New Testaments into Russia. And they just quietly said, some of us can go without going to eat on Sunday. Some of us can go without a movie. Some of us go without vacation. But as you can, we'd like this church to donate to do this. And little by little, then the red on the thermometer went back until the members replaced that. And so they were about halfway up when we came back. Can you imagine being in Russia and reading in Hebrews that he enters into a holy tent that's not made with hands, that's not of this place, and he didn't go in with the blood of bulls and goats, but he goes in with the blood and he makes atonement on the holy place? and you don't have an Old Testament. See, and I'm, I'm so proud that Eastside did that, but you put yourself in the position of people who've never read the story. In fact, one of the fundraising ideas, as people were first able to go in, two engineers, I don't know if they're in their 30s or 40s, had never seen a Bible before, and they asked to borrow one of these guys' Bible, and for two days, most of 24 hours, they took turns and read through the Bible for the first time. Chief, can you imagine having heard there's a Bible and have never had one in your hands? It, it's hard for us to imagine. We, we just got, you know, Bibles on the table and other stuff. And these two guys had heard, oh, there's a Bible, and they had one for the first time. And so they get permission to to get off work, and they take turns reading through, and they've never heard these stories before. And so what God is doing in Scripture is giving us this visual, and this cross is laid all the way across the Old Testament, but the influence of the cross extends all the way into and through the book of Revelation. The last part of this is that I love to read a book where a guy's been teaching something for 40 or 50 years, and the editor says, we're going to give you 80 pages. And I'm reading a little book on Revelation, and the guy had been teaching Revelation, like I said, four or five decades. And I'm reading along, and he said, have you ever noticed the Psalm 23 in the book of Revelation? And I'm thinking, Psalm 23, okay, that's in the Old Testament. What is he talking about? And as he goes through, he very briefly just says, when you come to the end of chapter 7, which is easy to remember, and you can read this, then they have washed their robes in the blood, and then here is the lamb who was slain, and he will be their shepherd. He will lead them to streams of living water. 
and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. And so the one who said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep while he's here alive, and he's introduced as the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, is still described in the very last book of scripture as shepherding and caring for his people. So that's why, and for those of you who are listening online, I'll just give you the references and if you have a piece of paper, you can write these down. And I just find things like this really interesting because one, we have the influence of the shadow of the cross that goes all the way back, I think, to he will bruise your heel, he will bruise your head, the discussion all the way back to the garden. And so it's not surprising when you come to a section like the teaching section in Romans, notice, and whether it's an illusion, whether it's an echo, whether it's the influence of, so here is Paul, Romans 12, 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Luke 6, 28, Jesus. Bless those who curse you. Romans 12, 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Matthew 5, 39, do not resist an evil person. Romans 12, 18 and 14, 19, live at peace with everyone. Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers. I was laughing this week, we were talking with a girl who was a nurse and who was helping us. And she says, oh, we were in Montana and lived on a cattle ranch and all this other stuff. And we got to talking about it and in a bit, we got to laughing. My grandfather had a neighbor to the south and a neighbor to the north that were just disagreeable. Uh, they grew up, grump uh, they woke up grumpy every day. And both of these guys had Herefords, the red white face and so trying to keep peace then my grandfather got black Angus because he said if any of our calves have one red hair on them both of these guys will say that one's mine <laughs> they were just grumpy unhappy always causing trouble and so to be a peacemaker living in between two neighbors who did not want to live at peace but they both had Herefords, and Grandad said, well, we're gonna go to Wheeler, and a guy had a registered Angus herd, and Grandad said, I wanna buy all of your old cows, don't take them to the sale barn, I might get one or two calves from them, and so he developed a registered Angus herd of black cattle, because both of his unhappy neighbors had red Herefords. As an elder, live at peace with all men and it's hard to say there are some people who don't want to live at peace i talked to a man who does trust and wills and he said and he's done this for decades and his father did this too he said about every fourth or fifth family there is someone in the family that regardless of what you do they're still not happy and the parents had died, the trust was read, and one of the sisters demanded that the trustees change the trust because she didn't get her share as she saw it. And against his advice, they finally changed it. And then she turned around and sued them for the interest that she should have gotten if it had been in the trust to begin with. And he said, son, you honor your parents by doing exactly what they said because some people are never gonna be happy with what you do. Well, here's this statement, live at peace with all men in so much as is possible with you. And then we have to sleep well when we say and, there's gonna be some situations where they're not gonna live at peace with us regardless, that's not our problem if we have done what Jesus asked us to do. Romans 13, 7, give to anyone that you owe. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. 
Matthew, uh, sorry, Mark 12, 14. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God? Romans 13, 8. Love one another. John 13, 34. Love one another. Romans 13, 8. He who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. And then love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself, and the law and the prophets depend on these, Matthew 22, 37. The commandments are summed up in this one rule, Romans 13, 9. Love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 12, sorry, 7, 12. Do to others what you would have them do to you. This sums up the law and the prophets. And this is important. We're going to close with this today. Romans 13, 11. Understand the present time. Luke 12, 56. How do you not know how to interpret the present time? Romans 13, 11. Wake up from your slumber because your salvation is nearer now. Mark 13, 36. Do not let him find you sleeping. Your redemption is drawing near. This is anticipating next week. And let me just say this. There are some people who feel like they should be the policeman for the brotherhood. And they spend all their time either commenting or judging or evaluating other people. And we'll come to this next week. Well, let me just say it this way. In dealing with various criticisms, my attitude has been, if God and Jesus are happy with what I'm doing, that is what is really important. And notice this, why do you judge your brother? Stop passing judgment on one another. Romans 14, 10, and 13. Matthew 7, 1. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. Important reminder, Romans 14, 12. Each of us will give an account of himself to God. Matthew 12, 36. Men will have to give an account on the day of judgment. Romans 14, 13. Make up your mind not to put a stumbling block in your brother's way. Alas, for the one who calls stumbling, Matthew 8, 10, 7. Romans 14, 14. No food is unclean in itself. All food is clean. Matthew 15, 10. What goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean. Mark 7, 19. Jesus declared all foods clean. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness. Romans 14, 17. Uh, do not worry about, and Jesus gives this whole list, Seek God's kingdom and his righteousness. And so what I want us to think about is that both in terms of predicted prophecy, anticipation, illusions, and I love the term echoes. We hear echoes of things all through the Old Testament. And I love the passage, and I'm out of memory, I think it's Hebrews 10, where the Hebrew writer says, the law is the shadow of things to come. And I always just put my hand down, and you only have a shadow when the reality comes and cast the shadow from the reality and you take the hand away and the shadow's gone. And for over 2,000 years, God gives us the shadow before the cross comes. As human beings, we can only create a shadow when the reality is there to begin with. And God, through prophecy, gives us over 2,000 years of shadow before the reality of the cross comes. Different people have different points of view, and I just, I totally accept that. And, and this is not a matter of just inflated pride or anything else. But I stop and think, of all the things that a church could call itself, and as I drive around sometimes, I just see these very interesting names, I think, isn't it appropriate and scriptural to refer to yourself as the church of Christ and that we seek to embody both the teaching and the mission of Christ in our generation. Um, and I just sometimes ask myself, why call yourself something, and yes, it may be very contemporary and people may like it, but it's not something that's given in Scripture. And the influence and the teaching of Jesus, both in shadow and then in reality all the way through, is such a significant part of our New Testament. 
So if you have the first page, we'll highlight some things and I'll leave much of this for you to read. When you hear a discussion of something like the Christian's relationship to the government, I don't know if Paul had contact, if he had heard things, and anticipate this, as we come to the end of Romans, the longest concentration, the biggest concentration of names in the whole New Testament is given in, in Romans 16, and here's the church that Paul hasn't visited. And it's amazing, he is able to write a letter and mention over 30 people by name, and he's never been there. And this is part of the influence of the city of Rome and all le roads lead to Rome. And so I don't know if he just did this out of general interest or if he had heard something, but here's two things that are significant. When the whole discussion of the government comes up, we find in Acts chapter 18, Aquila and Priscilla had been evicted from Rome because Claudius decreed that all the Jews had to leave Rome. I don't know if some of the Jews felt kind of anti-government, if they resented the fact that Claudius had evicted them, but for whatever reason, Paul just basically says, here is Christ, God's teaching for how a Christian relates to government. And this first part of Romans 13 is the clearest statement of that in the New Testament. I just listed the Roman Caesars, and you can read through the list. Uh, we hear of Augustus in the early part of the life of Jesus. He's going to die in A.D. 14. His two birth sons both had been killed along the way. No one knew this until the will was read, uh, but he adopted Tiberius, and Tiberius was 55. And so when the will, real will was read, then Tiberius became the next emperor. And so when we read about the crucifixion of Jesus, give to Caesar the things of Caesar's, we're going to be under Tiberius. The two that are just the most bizarre on this list, first of all, are Claudius, sometimes called Gaius. Um, absolute nutcase. And then when you come to the next one, bless his heart, um, a few years ago there was a, a, a documentary series called I, Claudius. And bless his heart, he had physical deformities. He um, limped some, he, he, head was a little bit to the side, he drooled sometimes, but the emperor before him was so terrible, uh, Claudius probably survived because of his defects. However, when he becomes emperor, he's an excellent emperor in terms of taking care of the empire and other stuff. But here's what's significant. On the way to the end of the first century, probably the worst emperor of the whole group is Nero. Uh, he wants to be worshiped as God. There's just a whole list of things, um, bizarre, uh, immoral, ungodly. And so when Paul is talking about the relationship that Christians have to the governing authorities, what's really significant is who was probably the worst emperor of the whole century is the current emperor when Paul is writing this. So here's what's important. As Christians, we can belong to different political parties, we can have different opinions of our ruling authorities, and I don't quibble with that. However, there is a level of respect for the office and a respect for the government that we are called to have and to practice as Christians, regardless of our political affiliation. And that's going to be a reflection of our relationship with Jesus. So if you look at the, the back of the, the first page, we're just going to read through. And I, I started this by just saying, here is the teaching about submission to the governing authorities. So we're in Romans 13 and 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. And this is what I highlighted. He's going to say this about six or seven different times. Paul will continue to place an emphasis that this is from God. There is no authority except from God, and those who exist have been instituted by God, and whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. 13.3, rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who's in authority? Then do what is good, 
and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good, but if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. Because of this, you also pay taxes. Authorities or ministers of God attend to this. And then look at the things that he lists in 13.7. Pay to all what is owed, taxes to whom taxes, revenue to whom revenue, respect to whom respect, honor to whom honor. 13.8. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves has fulfilled the law. And then he lists some commandments. Adultery, murder, stealing, covenant, don't do these things, but love your neighbors yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, the hour is come, and here's the warning about the future. Wake up from your sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. Cast off the works of darkness, put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in, and here's the list, orgies, drunkenness, sexual immorality, sensuality, quarreling, and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh, to gratify its desires. And I think it's very appropriate. How different are our lives to be because we're followers of Jesus uh, compared to our neighbors? Hypothetical, but stuck in my mind. Um, Otis Gatewood came to Ridgecrest a number of years ago, and I heard he was coming, so I, I drove down from Edmond and these were the days when the Iron Curtain was still up and they were smuggling Bibles into Russia and going in. And he had talked about it. He said, in my mind, I'd always felt like, you know, if I get captured and go to jail, ta da ta da ta And he said, when it happened, he said, it was just, it, he said, I just virtually melted like butter. Am I ever going to get out on and on? But he just talked about the challenge of trying to help Christianity spread in a place where, where the government is, is so hostile And not just that night, but the issue came up at a point in time. He said, if you were charged by a foreign government with being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Think about it. If you were arrested and charged by being a Christian, would there be enough evidence in your lifestyle to convict you, oh, that person is a Christian because he and she does you know, this, 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 and this. <clears throat> so, godly living is the thread from Romans to Jude, and this is going to include our relationship with God and neighbors and enemy. <clears throat> so if you turn the page, we'll summarize some of these and, and go through these quickly. What Paul basically is emphasizing is that Christians should be, yeah, just use the term good citizens. Um, our kids go to Carl Albert, our son's a junior in American history class on the second floor. And about a half mile away, straight across, was an American flag that is upside down. Anybody in the military know what is the significance of an American flag flying upside down? Distress, I'm wounded, come help me. Uh, this was a guy that had a Jeep blown out from under him in Indonesia. At a point in time, decided paying taxes was unconstitutional, and he actually went to prison because he wouldn't pay his taxes. Our son and his friends decided to go turn the flag right side up, and when they got there, here was a six foot fence with four rock wilders guarding the flag, so the flag stayed upside down. Three or four years later, and of course I didn't know this at the time, his wife came to church, we never saw him, 
and he passed away and she asked me to do his funeral and so I go to the house and they had taken the flag down but when I saw the flagpole and the fence I thought hmm and here's two sons and two daughters and when you ask what's your favorite memory of your dad and a son and the daughter leave the room in tears I'm thinking oh dear and just the amount of hardship that this family encountered because this man had certain convictions <clears throat> about his government and his motto was if you don't stand for what you believe you don't stand for anything but the whole family had suffered because rather than obeying the authorities, he'd actually gone to prison because he felt like the, the taxes and things were unconstitutional. So I want to go all the way down to number four. Love your neighbor. Owe no one else to each other. This is the fulfillment of the law. And then he has this final discussion. Put on the armor of light. One of the things I think is important for all of us to think about is... God places people in a given time, in a given place, and I like the term, in a given generation. In my grandfather and father's family, uh, there's only one daughter-in-law who's still alive. And at a point in time, that entire generation is going to go home. And one of my favorite verses about David is, David served the purpose of God in his generation. So my question to you is, what is God calling you to do in our generation while you're still here? And you read these last verses and Paul talks about, wake up, put on the armor, be awake, be alert, and serve. <clears throat> and he simply says, salvation is nearer than when we first believed. I had a heart procedure this week on Thursday. <clears throat> and I'm very mindful of this. Everything we do in life, we do sometimes for the last time. That's, that's our life. And I just thought, if Wednesday night is my last class, I can't change that, I can't go forward about it. All I can do is do the very best I can with each opportunity that we have. In our hymn book, it's song number 500. We once did an entire church camp on this, and we sang a different verse each day. But listen to the thought of this song, and this is our closing today. One sweetly solemn thought comes to me o'er and o'er. Today I'm nearer to my home than e'er I've been before. Nearer my father's house where many mansions be and nearer to the great white throne Nearer the crystal sea, nearer the bound of life, where falls my burden down, nearer to where I leave my cross and where I gain my crown. Savior, confirm my trust, complete my faith in thee, and let me feel as if I stood close to eternity. Feel as if now my feet were slipping o'er the brink, for I may now be nearer home, much nearer than I think.